as you enter into the aquarium hobby, you may find that there's some, should we call sticker shock on some of the things that you want or you see in the aquarium hobby. You see that, you know, that fish, that filter, that tank, that stand, that light, and all of a sudden it's like, you realize that this can be expensive, right? There is going to be some money involved in this hobby. So then you think to yourself, I can build that. I can do that. I can do a DIY version of that for so much cheaper and make it work just as good. But can you? Or should I say, is it worth it to do a DIY version or should you just buy the product you're looking at? Welcome back to the channel, everybody. I'm Trent Weldon with Well Done Tanks and this is a topic that I've actually have had some experience with in my own fish keeping career because I've run into this problem so many times. I look up something, I see a new product, um, I see it on YouTube, on Facebook, Instagram, somewhere, then you pull that product product up online and you realize that it's like $500. And there's no way you're gonna pay 500 bucks for a light. You're not gonna pay you know, 50 bucks for a brine shrimp hatcher. And why, would the he why the heck would you pay $1,000 for a stand? It's ludicrous. So you think to yourself, I can do that. So many times I've actually looked into that. I've looked into doing like a DIY version of something in that hope to save myself some money. But when you really look into it and like you, you start adding up the, the cost of all the parts, maybe some parts you gotta ship in from like out of country, you know, it's wherever you can find them, it can actually be more expensive to do a DIY version versus buying one. There's also plenty of things too that I've done in my hobby where a DIY version did save me money and was the best route to go. And I have a list tonight of five things that I have had both done a DIY version of and purchased in my aquarium hobby. So I've been on both ends of the spectrum and I wanna give you my opinion on whether I think it is something that you should DIY or if it's something you should just flat out buy. All right, so this list is not in any specific order. It's kind of as I could think about it and write it up. But again, all five items are things that I have both done a DIY version of and things I have both bought a version of. So the first thing, and this is probably the one that I think is the best way to go DI, D, the DIY route on this. This is gonna turn into a tongue twister video. All right, so first thing, aquarium stands. I'm gonna say this, that hands down, I think it is best to do a DIY version of an aquarium stand. Now saying that, if we move into the extremely large tanks, you know, 500 gallon, 600 gallon, kind of that 300 gallon and up, you may want to look into doing purchasing a stand, even a metal stand. So we're going to focus in on tanks that are like, the largest I've done is 220 gallons down to 10 gallon tanks, 20 gallon tanks, 55 gallon tanks. So more of those ma more manageable sizes for majority of people. Now again, you may be half, hefty. You may be able to craft your own metal stand if you have the welding experience, but we're going to focus in on building aquarium stands out of wood. Super cheap extremely strong. So a great example of this is the 90 gallon tank here behind me in the YouTube studio is that is a DIY version of a stand. My wife assisted me with this one. So I built a two by four stand, very simple. It's just kind of the base of it, the frame of it. There's plenty of tutorials online. So this will not be a video based around tutorials, but building a a two by four aquarium stand is cheap and it's efficient and it's simple. You can really do this with a drill and a handsaw. Fortunately, I have a chop saw, you know, miter saw, super easy to go that way. And then my wife came in and just faced out the front of it with some cheap common board. We put a stain over it and it turned out fantastic. Looks so good. And when we did a DIY version of this, we were able to customize the color we wanted, the height we wanted, the width we wanted. So you can make all these customizable adjustments to it. Where when I went to look to buy an aquarium stand, this was even with the waterfront offering, you know, to you know sponsor it here and give me a good deal on a stand. It was still over eight hundred dollars to get one that even remotely looked good in my opinion. And oftentimes if you go buy a stand from most pet stores, kind of chains or other areas, you may find they're built out of particle board, which when they get water on it, it expands and crumbles. So a two by four stand is gonna be much more sturdy Then you can even build it out of like two by sixes if you need to make the little more, you know, a little more strength. In my old fish room area, 
every stand in there was built at a two by four and all done by myself. So that's what I say, I would absolutely lean towards a DIY version of an aquarium stand is going to save you money. But again, on those rare occasions, it may be better for safety purposes to buy one. All right, item number two on this list, and this is something I've had more experience with as of recent since I've changed over my fish room now to a breeding operation, more of a working fish room, that is a brine shrimp hatcher. All across YouTube and all across the internet, you can find super simple and extremely cheap options to do brine shrimp hatchers. The cheapest being, take a water bottle, cut it in half, the bottom part of it turns into your base, the top part of it with the cap turns into your hatcher because it makes a nice cone shape out of the water bottle. Fill that bottom portion with some rock, some sand, some gravel, whatever it may be. There you have it, super simple to do. Now I wasn't gonna argue, you can go even as farther as taking like a bowl out of your kitchen, a vase you may have for flowers, and you can technically turn that into a brine shrimp hatcher. Like, you, I think you can get away with using about anything in your kitchen to really turn it into a brine shrimp hatcher. Now the argument I'm gonna have on this one, even though the, the water bottle is an incredibly cheap option, because really all you need for any of these is gonna be a simple air pump, and if you use something like the USB air pump from Aquarium Co-op, I think they're running like eight, nine dollars right now. You can probably even find cheaper versions of an air pump on Amazon. And when you're hatching out a little bit of brine shrimp, you don't need a big air pump. So there's a lot of cheap air pump options. Now, the, the caveat to this is, is it, is it efficient? So building these, okay, it's cheap, but is it gonna be efficient for you on the way of actually feeding your brine shrimp out? Now, I've done reviews on the brine shrimp hatchery disc, which is a no air needed. It's like 30 bucks, I think, 25, $30. Super nice disc for a brine shrimp hatchery, and it's you know, no air required. So it's even easier to do that to set up with, in, you know, and by the time you gather parts again, it could be more expensive, depending on what route you wanna go. Like, I've gathered all the parts to actually build the version that uh, Master Breeder Dean had in his fish room for a while, and it honestly, I'm about, I'm over $20 in parts right now. So I really argue the efficiency standpoint where buying one, again, you gotta look at the quality you're buying. This, I think San Francisco Bay has one that you can put a two liter water bottle, you just screw it onto it. Okay, that's a big bottle for a lot of brine shrimp, right? But then it's feeding the brine shrimp can be incredibly difficult out of that, depending on the separation of eggs you have, you know, versus unhatched eggs, versus hatched eggs, shell of eggs, all that kind of a thing. So I would recommend looking into something like the Zis brine shrimp hatcher. I'm running two of them in my fish room. Now, are they more expensive? Yes. But they're incredibly efficient for me to feed eggs, the brine shrimp out of because of the valve at the bottom of the hatcher. So I'm kind of split down the middle on this one. I'm gonna say do a DIY version if you maybe have one or two tanks that you wanna feed some brine shrimp to, so it's not a, it's more kind of a, another hobby in the hobby. Now if you're gonna be hatching out a lot of brine shrimp like I am daily, maybe every other day, I would look into something like the Zis Hatcher basically because it's gonna come down to the efficiency process of that. The third item on our list tonight of DIY or buy, and this one may kind of come as a surprise to you, it's actually going to be fish food. I have done my own fish food. Now when I say I've made my own fish food, done my own fish food, I really just bought a bunch of ingredients, mixed them up, blended them together, and made a goopy mess that I could feed to my fish. Now, it's not a goopy mess because you freeze it, so you can have, you can actually make large quantities of fish food, but it can be expensive based on what ingredients you're putting in there. Things I did things like shrimp, what did I do? Shrimp, I didn't think I put some flake food in there. Uh, peas, you could do some like kale. So there's a uh, uh, beef heart, it's another big thing you can put in there too is a beef heart. So gathering the supplies can be kind of difficult, but it also comes down to usually you do a DIY version of food if it's very specific reasons. Now when I had my Mabu puffer, I can't argue that buying packaged frozen shrimp was a DIY version of food, but it was a specific a diet requirement for that fish that I needed to meet. So purchasing like clams on the half shell, right? Not really a DIY food, but it's not your everyday food. Now, Fish of Hex has done some fantastic videos on making your own fish food, showcasing all the ingredients he's putting into his. But he has very specific reasons for doing that, and it's actually to get nutrients to the entire tank where he is a reefing expert, 
grows massive amounts of coral, so he's using that for a very specific purpose. We're focusing mainly on the freshwater side of things, so I have done my own fish food. Uh, it was more kind of a fun project to do versus anything, where it can say it can be expensive. Now the one I will argue on the freshwater side, which is used to for a really targeted purpose, is what we call snello. It's snail, it's snail food, right? typically towards the apple snail or sometimes called the mystery snail. Now, Lav's Snail Cells on YouTube, she's the queen of Instagram, has got an incredible page, recommend to check her out. Also check out her YouTube channel. She does great versions of Snello, where it's, again, it's that mixed up ingredients, freeze it, then you can feed it to your snails. And she just did one based around duckweed. How cool is that? Now, purchasing your food, can be cheaper, depends on how many tanks you have to feed, what kind of fish are you keeping, and arguably, most purchased foods and the manufactured foods are actually going to have more nutrition in them versus doing your own DIY food. So there's some arguments we made there. On this one, I'm gonna say for the average hobbyist, purchasing your, your manufactured fish food is gonna be the route to go. If you're looking for that thing to try out at least once, I recommend making your own fish food at least that one time because it is kind of fun, but I promise you it's going to stink. So make sure you do it when everybody's out of the house, you don't get yelled at. All right, getting into number four on our list, it's going to be filtration. Now this is, this is an interesting one. First off, I'm going to say the, yes, for the average hobbyist, buying your filtration needs is going to be the best route to go. Let's say you have a 20 gallon tank, a 29 gallon tank, a 55 gallon tank. I have run all of those tanks off a USB nano air pump and a sponge filter from Aquarium Co-op. That's like, that's under 20 bucks for one set of that. So then you move into, let's say you wanna run two or three sponge filters in that 55 gallon. I've run two or three USB air pumps to each sponge filter, you know, one air pump per sponge filter in a 55 gallon tank, up to three sponge filters. Now, hang on the back filtration. Canister filters are all there, but the sponge filter is honestly the cheapest and easiest filtration to get up and running. Now, if you're looking for a larger tank, like the 90 gallon tank behind us, the waterfront was kind enough to sponsor that tank with a canister filter, which was expensive. It was a couple hundred dollar filter and it does a great job on this tank of what I need it to do. So now we get into, again, some specifics here. For the average hobbyist, a sponge filter or a hang on the back filter, in my opinion, is going to be the easiest and most efficient filtration for them. One, it's easy to set up. Two, it's the easiest to clean. If you don't clean your filter, it's not really a filter. Canister filter, I clean twice a month because I have a set schedule to remind myself to do that. Where some people, you talk to them, they haven't pulled that canister filter out from underneath that tank for years. And I can only imagine at that point. Now let's move into though, where I think a DIY version is going to save you some money. And it can be kind of a fun project too. And that is for a sump filtration. Now what is a sump? A sump is another tank that's going to hold water, that's going to run an external pump to move water back up to the main tank. So water is going to overflow from the main tank somehow down to the sump, get pushed back up with the, with the pump, and then down below that is going to be where all your filtration is housed, your biomedia, that kind of a thing. Now people like sumps because you can hide all of your equipment down in the sump. On my first 220 gallon tank, I ran a 75 gallon sump. I bought a 75 gallon tank from Petco. I think it was when they had their, had their um, dollar per gallon sale. The 75 gallon was a half off deal, so it was a good deal. I used some PVC pipe to build a platform, and then I used some egg crate to lay on top of that platform. Two five gallon buckets, loaded that up with the uh, pot scrubbies you can buy from the dollar store. It's like five for a buck. Filled up two five gallon buckets of that and had the water rain into that filtration, calling it a trickle tower. Then it's had an external pump that pumped the water back up to the tank. It was a lot of filtration for a first 220 gallon tank where I had my Mabu puffer and a, a myriad of other fish. So it was, I needed a large filtration system, but I didn't want to spend hundreds or thousands of dollars on a sump filter. Now, if you look at some of these manufactured sumps, they are a work of art. Wow, they're incredible looking, but they come with a price tag. I have purchased the 
a tr uh, trigger system sump before for my first saltwater tank I ever had and ever did. And I'm gonna say like, I really think that was a mistake. That was a mistake for me. Just because I didn't need all the bells and whistles that it came with, I mainly liked it because it was cool, right? So building your own sump can save you a lot of money. Now again, if you have very specific needs, very specific requirements, yeah, check out some of those manufactured sumps. Check out things like Fish of Hex, um, Reef Dudes. You know, again, I'm referencing a lot of saltwater channels for the sumps because that's where primarily you're going to see most of it. But I've done sumps for freshwater tanks. They work really well. And that, in that, that case, I say, is where it's gonna be better to do a DIY version. But for your average starting hobbyist, check out your manufactured filtration products. Number five on our list, and again, this is one I've done in the past. It was fun to do, it was cool. But I just don't think it's necessary anymore. And that's the lighting for your tank. All right, hear me out on this one. When I first got into the hobby, I was looking for ways to DIY anything I possibly could. My first 75 gallon tank I had, I honestly did a DIY filter. I did actually two DIY filters and I did a DIY uh, light on it. I did the DIY version where you take some rain gutter, chop it up in whatever, however length of piece you need, you spray paint the outside black, you wrap the inside with the reflective HVAC tape, and then you put in there the uh, LED strip lights you can buy on Amazon, right? I think it totaled me like $25 to do at the time. And it was cool. It was honestly cool because it was a fun project. I got to change the colors on it. But now here's my argument though, is there's so many cheap options of lighting on the market right now that it may not actually be worth your time to do a DIY version. Now, in some cases, I've seen some DIY, I, DIY, <laughs> I told you to be a tongue twister. DIY lights that look really cool. Now in that in that category, you're gonna see things brought up like shop lights, LED floodlights, you know, that are kind of like are DIY because they're not sold in specifically to the market of aquarium keeping. So that's where they kind of fall into that DIY version. And I've done both of them. I've run the LED floodlights on a tank down my fishing right now, and I've done a review on that. I've run a shop light over a 125 gallon tank and had it, it looked good, right? So now the argument comes in, what do you want the lighting for? Are you looking to grow plants on a freshwater side? Are you looking to just observe your fish, right? So that's where it really comes down to, but I still think that most of these cheap LED options on Amazon are going to do everything you want it to do. They're gonna grow your plants. They're gonna let you look at your fish. So it's, I really think the argument here is going to be, it's not worth your time to do a DIY version of lighting when there's so many other options on the market right now. But again, it can be fun to do it, so you may wanna try it, I'm just gonna give my recommendation to check out some cheap options like the Finex Stingray, uh, the version one, one of my favorite lights of all times. You're gonna get it and it doesn't feel the most like sturdy of a light, but it's super, it just looks good. It looks sleek and you can, I've grown so many plants with that light and uh, my fish look great underneath it. Now, I also argue this of in my breeding racks, I'm using four foot LED T5 shop lights. I literally am and they work great. I'm growing like things like mosses and guppy grass just for some cover for the fish. And it fit my needs better because I could buy a package of six for a very cheap price. And therefore I could put lighting on six different shelves or you know, six different areas versus having to buy things again of one LED light per shelf. So it comes down to your needs as well. If you got one or two tanks, check out some like things like the Phoenix Stingray. Um, the, the Nitro lights on Amazon are really popular right now, but if you've got a whole breeding room and you just want some ambient lighting or some kind of light over it, check out the LED T5 shop lights. They're very cheap, they're energy efficient. You can even link them together to where one plug can run like four different lights all linked together, but you can't necessarily do that with the manufactured lights. So I still say check out the manufactured lights specifically on the aquarium side, but it also comes down to your needs and what you wanna do with it. All right, guys, that is my my list of five things, the DIY versus buy. 
Now I'm curious, leave me a comment below if there's something that I did not mention on my list that you have done in your hobby, or do you have different opinions of things I've talked about? You know, is it, do you feel it's better to buy everything? Are you a DIY person? So always curious to hear what you guys have going on, what your opinion is. Again, I really hope this video helped somebody because I do aim to help those coming into this hobby on many different aspects. So if you enjoyed this video, hit the thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and we'll talk to you guys in the next one.